Okay, uh, welcome to um, this very special SOAS Taiwan Studies uh, annual lecture. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Joseph Wong from the University of Toronto. I'm not sure how many um, talks Joe's given us uh, on the Taiwan program over the last decade. I think this is maybe the, the fourth or the, or the fifth one. So he's a, a, um, a regular visitor, someone who can compete with, um, with Mike Hall in, in our kind of uh, uh, competition who's given the most uh, Taiwan talks. One of the things that's very special about this talk is it's a co-sponsored talk. So um, uh, it's also been sponsored by the SOAS China Institute and also the um, uh, SOAS Department of Politics uh, and International Studies. Now when I welcome new students here to the, uh, the Taiwan program, one of the things that I, um, I mentioned is that over this year at SOAS, you're going to meet a lot of the people that are on your Taiwan course reading lists. And I think there's few people on our reading lists that appear more uh, often than, than uh, uh, Joseph uh, Wong. Um, I first got to know uh, Joseph when we were both PhD students. Um, um, and we tended to meet at the uh, North American Taiwan Studies uh, Conference. That's, I think, the longest, uh, longest running annual Taiwan Studies Conference. Uh, and in many ways, the, what we tried to do in terms of creating a, a European version of that conference is what, what we know as the uh, European Association of, of Taiwan Studies, which has now been going for, I think, 11 or, or 12 uh, years. I think there's a number of things that I really appreciate, uh, appreciate about um, uh, Professor Wong's uh, work. I think that the first thing I, I've always appreciated is his comparative focus. Um, and we can see this in uh, his book, really groundbreaking first book, Healthy Democracies. Um, which looks at welfare state development in uh, Taiwan and South Korea, and looks at the relationship between welfare development and democratization. It's a, again, it's, a, it's a, a book that we use on a number of our, um, both Taiwan and East Asia Pacific um, courses. We also look at his um, work on um, political parties. Um, a few years ago, he published a book called uh, learning to Lose, which, look, which looks at how uh, East Asian political parties dealt with uh, losing or not losing. And I think there's a little bit of overlap there between uh, that book and the paper he's going to uh, present uh, today. Uh, Joe's published uh, four books. His most recent one was uh, looking at the, the biotech uh, industry, which was trying to build on his earlier work that looks at the development, developmental state uh, in Taiwan. And again, this, we've also used this on a number of our political economy courses uh, at, at SOAS. Um, and he hasn't just been publishing a lot of books and journal articles, but he's also been involved in institution building. Um, and, and from 2005 until uh, 2014, he, he headed the um, uh, Asia Institute uh, at the University of, of Toronto. So he's so he's, he's finally uh, free of that. Um, today he's chosen a very provocative uh, topic, uh, Conceding to Thrive, Taiwan's Path to Democracy and Lessons um, for China. I think if you think about what's going on in Hong Kong, I think this topic is, is uh, really topical. I, know, I think I'm pretty sure, we, I'm sure we'll get some Hong Kong uh, questions. Okay, um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to, to Joe, and hopefully we should have lots of time for, for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debeth. Uh, let me uh, begin by thanking Debeth for this fantastic opportunity for a couple reasons. Um, first, uh, as Debeth has already mentioned, he and I have known each other for um, about 20 years now. He still looks the same. Um, <laughs> I, on the other hand, uh, uh, do not. Um, but we had an opportunity to get to know one another when we were uh, graduate students and when we were grappling with what was then still a very young but very vibrant Taiwan studies field. Uh, it was the time when folks were writing about Taiwan's economic miracle. It was a time when Taiwan was uh, uh, the archetypal case for democratic uh, transitions. And so it was a really fecund moment in Taiwan studies. And it was a real pleasure to get to know David uh, then and certainly uh, over the years. 
It's also a real pleasure for me to speak at SOAS um, and speak at SOAS repeatedly. Um, it's because at the University of Toronto, we have 70,000 students. Uh, just to give you some sense of the scale of that, for the last five years, I've taught Introduction to Politics, Paul 101, to 1,200 students um, at the same time. So it's a room with 10 balconies. You have to wear a microphone. Um, so anytime I have an opportunity to speak in front of an audience of less than 500 people, it feels like a very intimate setting for me. So this is a fantastic opportunity to be able to share some ideas in what is frankly an intimate setting for me. And I look forward to exchanging ideas and discussion um, with you after the talk. What I present to you today is a paper that I've written with uh, Professor Dan Slater at the University of Chicago. Some of you might know him. He's a uh, specialist on Southeast Asian politics. And we wrote this paper, and we are now uh, under contract to turn this paper into a book uh, over the next uh, couple of years. But let me give you some sense of the inspiration for this book. This was really, in many ways, a side project for me. You really look at some of the work that I've been doing over the last four or five years, I've been really looking at issues of poverty reduction, and I find myself more often than not in places like India, certainly in China, and places in Africa as well. But the inspiration for this book first emerged in the 2008 book that Dave referenced, Learning to Lose. And when we came out with that book, we had a conference at the University of Toronto, and one of the uh, guests at the conference was a, a very famous political scientist and anthropologist, James Scott. And he used a phrase which I thought was so uh, pointed, and it's something that has stuck with me. And he said, really what this conference is about is what he called, quote unquote, the inconvenience of losing. And it really stuck with me, right? That, you know, after all, democracy is not so much about winning. Democracy really is about losing. And what motivated that book uh, was a series of events that happened in Taiwan in 2004. And so that book really was a book, even though it involves cases from the Congress Party in India to Pri in Mexico, it was a book really aimed at the Kuomintang. Taiwan. And the title, Learning to Lose, was really a tract, if you will, uh, regarding the KMT in Taiwan. What motivates this book, however, and what we have in our sights in this book, is China. And the article version of this uh, came out in Perspectives on Politics, and we don't actually talk about China until the last two or three paragraphs. But you can see that the entire article is a slow build put China in our sights, and to put, in many ways, the Chinese Communist Party at task. Essentially, what we ask in this paper, and what I'm interested in, is why does a party, a dominant party, concede democracy? Why would a dominant party concede the quote-unquote inconvenience of losing? So what motivates this, then, is really two questions. Why do some dominant parties choose democracy and survive? And what I think is even more puzzling is why do some dominant parties choose democracy when they don't have to? Well, that's actually a very compelling question, right? Why do you choose democracy when you don't have to? Why would a party concede it, the possibility of losing when it doesn't have to? In many ways, this seems counterintuitive. Certainly, if one looks at how we think about democracy today, when one points to things like the Arab Spring and so on, we oftentimes think about democracy as being a concession when you have no other choice. But what we're suggesting, actually, is what seems to be a counterintuitive logic, is that you can actually concede democracy when you don't have to. Now, I say it's counterintuitive from the outset, but I want to argue that, in fact, it's not counterintuitive at all. For us, democracy is about choosing democracy. It is, after all, a choice. So on one level, our book is, or our article, really is a response to modernization theory. Modernization theory, which has you know, continued to have tremendous influence on how we think about development and so on. Modernization theory would suggest to you that societies modernize over time, they economically develop over time. You have people moving from the countryside into cities, industrialization, literacy, and middle class, and boom, you have democracy. <laughs> it's as though you go to bed one night in living in a dictatorship, and the next morning you have democracy. That's basically as far as modernization theory takes us. 
What we want to argue is that in the end, you may have all of those structural prerequisites, but what matters in the end is that democracy has to be chosen. It is a decision to democratize. Modernization theory, we argue, does not answer how. Now, Barbara Getty is a very influential political scientist who works largely on Latin America, based in the United States. She does try to explain how. And she does try to explain why democracies emerge when they do. Her body of work basically makes the following argument, that dominant, dominant parties negotiate their extrication. That's what dominant parties do. When they democratize, it is under the conditions under which they are negotiating their extrication. And here she writes in 1999 in a seminal piece, and I want to read you this quote. She writes, the preferences of party cadres are much simpler than those of military officers. Like democratic politicians, they, meaning party cadres, simply want to hold office. Now there are a couple implications with respect to this quote. The first is, the argument she's making here is that the military or military regimes are different from dominant party regimes in the sense that generals can always return to the barracks. They can launch a coup, they can say they're a caretaker government, but they can always return to their barracks and say that their work is done. And they can do so relatively, at least in most cases, unscathed. Hence, in her theory, military regimes are more likely to concede. But in her theory, and the second point she makes here, is that parties want to hold power. Thus, for Gettys, democracy is not a choice. Dominant parties hang on to power until the very end. They hang on until they have effectively no choice. And her theory feeds into then the conventional wisdom surrounding things like the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a perfect example of dictatorships that hung on to the very end. And they hung on to the very end because those dictators wanted to hold power. Now, we partly agree with Barbara Kennedy. Um, she's never responded to our article, so we don't know if she appreciates the article or not. We do partly agree with Barbara Geddes in the sense that we do agree that dominant parties want to hold on to power. Let's not fool ourselves here, right? The perks of power holding are just too overwhelming. Everybody wants to, at least in the case of politics and high politics, hold on to power. But whereas Barbara Geddes argues that dominant parties will hang on to the bitter end, where she argues that parties will only concede democracy by negotiating their extrication, i.e. they don't want their head on a pike, and they'll negotiate their immunity concession, we say that this is not always true empirically. That in fact, sometimes dominant parties will concede democracy <coughs> before the bitter end. They will concede democracy, they will hasten democratic reforms before they have reached what Barbara Geddes refers to as the bitter end. A good example is the Indonesia. And it's a good example because it's really the weakest example. In May of 1998, of course, the Suharto uh, regime is overthrown. To most observers around the world, this looked like the end of Golkar, which of course was the ruling party. So you have Suharto, who was the head of the regime. You have Golkar, which was the ruling party. Habibi takes over the leadership of Golkar. And by every measure, he is a weak president. Right? He is inheriting a political economy that has just suffered through the throes of the Asian financial crisis in 1997. In other words, he really is hanging on by a thread. Now, Gettys would predict that if you are the head of a dominant party, if you are a dictator hanging on by a thread, you will repress. You will repress to the end because you want to hang on to power for as long as you possibly can. What we actually see happen in Indonesia is very interesting. Rather than repress, Habibi expedites the elections. The elections were supposed to happen in 2002, and in fact, he holds them in 1999. The puzzling question is, why would he do that? Why would he move the elections forward when he himself is a weak president? Now, by every measure, he is a weak president. But the party remains strong. It's weakening. It's certainly not as strong as it was in 1996, but the party remains strong. There is still a developmental state legacy. This, after all, is Indonesia, which had grown its economy over the last few decades. The Golkar party was extremely powerful in the sense that it had a sort of territorial advantage. It was a national party, and it had legislative reforms for decentralization, which allowed it to even spread, to allow it to spread its 
uh, political machinery and its tentacles even further. And indeed, Golkart appealed to the periphery. So in other words, the 1999 elections actually wasn't a bad choice. It was a bad choice for Habibi. It wasn't a bad choice for Golkar. Habibi, of course, loses the elections, but Golkar comes and second. In other words, he concedes democratic reforms at a time when he didn't have to. In fact, we would have expected him to hang on. But he concedes at a time when the party is strong enough to win a plurality of votes in 1999. And in fact, by 2004, Golkar comes in first place again. So the point here is that Golkar was spiraling downwards. Gettys would predict that the party would hang on. But instead, the leader of the party chooses democracy. He saves the party by institutionalizing democracy. In other words, he conceded to minimally survive. And by 2004, it was clear that he had conceded and thrived. Korea, I think, is in many ways an even better case. You will all recall that Park Chan-hee was, of course, assassinated in 1979. This was seen as a potential democratic opening. A new leader comes in, a new general, Chen doo comes in. And he immediately unleashes what is now known as the infamous Gwangju Massacre. Chen doo Hwan clamps down on this potential democratic opening. Now, Gettys would predict again that this was a party that was embattled. This was a ruling regime that was embattled and that it would hang on to the very bitter end. And it would use the, every repressive measure that it possibly could. And there's good reason to think this. In 1985, for instance, in the National Assembly elections, the ruling party only wins 54% of the seats with one third of the popular vote. Right? This was a party in decline. The only reason why it won 54% of the seats was because of the jerry-rigged electoral system, which gave it a massive seat bonus. In June of 1987, the anointed successor to Chen Duhuan, the expected continued authoritarian dictator successor to Chen Duhuan, is of course No Te Wu. And he announces in June of 1987, in response to a massive movement, which was called the Mingzhou Movement, a massive movement of students, unions, the church, the middle class, he concedes. In June of 1987, he concedes and announces presidential elections for later that year, full presidential elections, releases political prisoners, and has full national legislative elections in the spring of 1998. The question is, why would he do that? And this actually is an important empirical question, and Death and I were talking about this. We don't have enough evidence just yet. But the question is, why would No Tebu concede when theory would tell us, and certainly logic in a way would tell us, that he would repress and hang on to the very end? Why would he subject himself to the inconvenience of losing when he didn't have to? Well, part of it was, again, the developmental state legacy. The fact of the matter, and Haggard and Kaufman talk about this, what is, you, what is distinctive about Korea's democratization is that they chose democracy in economically good times. Right? This was not a country uh, with an economy that was spiraling downwards. This was actually a good time in Korea's economy. The ruling party had legislated a uh, limited elections. This gave the ruling party some sense of feedback. It also assured No Tewu that they had candidates. They had experience. They could run an election. So yeah, we're going to concede democracy. We're going to have elections. But we have the best candidates. We have the most experienced candidates out there. And most importantly, No Tebu gambled. He gambled that the opposition would split. He gambled that the Mingzhou movement would split. And he gambled that the opposition leaders would split, the opposition leaders being Kim Dae-jung and Kim Il-sam at the time. And he was right. The Mingzhou movement quickly falls apart after the summer of 1987. Kim Il-sam and Kim Dae-jung, despite overtures of working together, eventually split as well. And we see a split vote. No Tewu says in 1988, however, there is a strong wind of change blowing over the country. The day when freedoms and human rights could be slighted in the name of economic growth and national security has ended. He's basically slapping Pan Chani and Sun Duan in the face. The day when repressive force and torture in secret chambers were tolerated are, I should say, are over. This was a huge gamble by No Tewu. This was a huge gamble, but the incumbent regime gets away with it. The ruling regime gets away with it. Instead of hanging on by authoritarian means, he instead concedes democracy. Now, don't get me wrong. This was a huge risk. 
he gambled that the opposition would split, and they did. But in the end, at least from his vantage point in the June of 1987, the gains from democracy outweighed the continued costs of repression. The best example of this the logic, of course, and indeed where we inductively generate this theory of conceding the thrive, really is Taiwan. Right? And this, of course, is a very famous quote by Tim Tingbo in which he says, the times are changing, the environment is changing, the tide is also changing. This was uttered right before the DPP forms in 1986. Of course, uh, most Taiwan watchers at the time expected the KMT to clamp down on the DPP. And we do have evidence to suggest that this was an option that CCK was entertaining, but instead <clears throat> decided to allow the DPP to form in the Grand Hotel. Martial law was lifted shortly thereafter, and full legislative elections were held in 1992. In other words, the Kuomintang concedes democracy when it didn't have to. After all, the, tide, the times may have been changing, but the KMT was still by far and away the most powerful political actor in Taiwan. And the second is that it not only concedes democracy to survive, but of course the electoral record, and Deb is the expert on this, the electoral record shows that the KMT is continuing to by and large. Right. <clears throat> so the key point here is that Geddes expects democracy to emerge from positions of weakness. She expects that dominant parties will concede democracy when they have no other choice, during crisis moments, when they have been weakened to the point that they have no other choice but to give it up, hence the Arab Spring. We argue, on the other hand, that democracy, in fact, can come from a position of strength. In other words, we assume, as does Geddes, that dominant parties do want to remain in power. They want power. They want to stay in office. But this does not necessarily mean by hanging on to authoritarian means. In other words, the desire to remain in power could also incentivize the dominant party to concede. So as Dan and I write in our 2013 article, dominant parties can be incentivized to concede democratization from a position of exceptional strength, the KMT, and not only from a position of extreme weakness, which is what Geddes would predict. In other words, to borrow from the language of political science and economics, democracy is incentive compatible for strong authoritarian parties. And what I want to tell you now is a story not of great men. I'm not going to suggest to you that Jiang Tingbo and Note Wu or these people were great men. They were men. But rather, we want to make the argument that they were strategically rational men. So our theory really unfolds in three parts. The first part of our theory argues that you have to have antecedent strengths. It's far more likely that a dominant party will concede to thrive when it has antecedent strengths. But another way, antecedent strengths increases the probability of a concede to thrive logic. When ruling parties are confident neither of their defeat nor of instability. So we basically argue that antecedent strength gives parties confidence. And it gives them two kinds of confidence. It gives them stability confidence. And stability confidence comes out of state power. So things like the developmental state, political stability, economic growth, a thickened conservative voting middle class. Anna Jismali Busi in her work on post-Soviet transitions talks about a usable past and so on, right? So there is stability confidence, and there is also <coughs> victory confidence. That even by conceding democracy, they're fairly confident that they will win, that their party appeals, that they enjoy, for instance, cross-cutting appeal, that they are a national party, a territorially encompassing party, that they have a national party narrative. <coughs> And probably most importantly, that they have electoral experience. They know how to win elections. Right? So the point here is that you have antecedent strengths, which gives you confidence, stability confidence, and victory confidence. The key point we want to make here, therefore, then, and this is very distinct from what Getty would argue, conceding democracy does not equal conceding defeat. She's absolutely right. Dominant parties want to hang on to power. So to concede democracy does not mean conceding the loss of power. Conceding democracy may, in fact, if you have confidence, may, in fact, lead to quite the opposite. It may, in fact, lead to uh, holding on to power. So you want to have a situation in which there's little chance of instability and, indeed, little chance of 
There's always a chance. But in the eyes of the rulers, it's so remote that the risk is worth taking. The second part of our theory is that you still nonetheless have to receive an ominous signal. After all, democratic transitions and conceding democracy is a risk proposition. On the one hand, you may have all the antecedent strengths in the world to be confident. The fact of the matter is when you concede democracy, you are conceding the probability or the possibility that you might lose. In other words, you have to have some sense that your hold on power is waning. Right? You need, so it's not just a signal, it has to be an ominous signal. So what we argue is that you're most likely to concede and thrive when you've passed your apex of power. Right? Parties that have passed their apex of power. They're still power enough, powerful enough that they can win a majority, but that their power is nonetheless in steady decline. So these signals matter. The most important, I think, or the clearest signal we argue for are electoral signals. Electoral signals are the clearest signal that your party power is in decline. And we see this playing an important role in Korea in 1985. We see this playing an important role in Taiwan. We see this playing an important role, arguably, in Singapore. We don't see this playing an important role, and to foreshadow my argument, in China, because they don't exist. Other signals matter as well, public protest. And not just selective public protest, but cross-cutting cross -cutting public protest. That's why the Mingzhou movement in Korea was so critical. This was not a workers' movement, as we saw in 1980 with the Gwangju uprising. This was a cross-class, cross-cleavage, encompassing national protest movement. Geopolitical signals matter. Losing a superpower patron means a great deal. Right? Losing the support, for instance, of the United States at the ending of the Cold War meant a big deal to these authoritarian regimes. And of course, economic signals matter. Now, these are a little more contested. Right? An economic shock can be interpreted as an indirect shock. But nonetheless, it may transform itself into a narrative that begins to weaken um, the uh, ruling party's hold on power. We argue basically that when a ruling party has passed its apex of power, it is now in what we call the bittersweet spot. It's a sweet spot in the sense that it's the best time to concede and thrive. It's bittersweet for the ruling party because, well, they have to make a concession. So we don't actually have this in our article, but we use this slide in our talks. We, we came up with this. We wrote this article, actually, in a Starbucks in Madison, Wisconsin, sitting across from one another. So we came up with this table to figure out what the hell we were talking about. And we came up with this, with this chart. And basically, it's very simple. It's certainly it's a stylized uh, image. But basically, what we have here is a curve illustrating party power. Right? And so a party can be continually accumulating sources of power and antecedent strengths, but at some point it passes its apex of power and it begins its decline. And we argue there in that top right quadrant, that's the bittersweet spot. That's the time in which it's most likely that you can concede and thrive. The corollary, of course, is that once you pass that dotted line, you hang on to the bitter end. It's too late. You've hurtled through the bittersweet spot. And that's when Getty's logic kicks in. You have no other choice. This is when you want your child to get through Harvard. This is when you start capital flight. This is when you start making all of the uh, arrangements that you necessarily have to make as you're about to face your bitter end. But the bittersweet spot is the part on the curve that we're most interested in. And again, it's the part on the curve in which it is most likely that a concede to thrive uh, scenario will unfold. So we have antecedent strengths, we have ominous signals, and what this then suggests to the ruling party is that they need a re-legitimation strategy. Right? Clearly the old way of doing business has begun to wane. Clearly the old way of winning support has begun to wane. Clearly the old narrative is beginning to lose resonance with people living in your country. Now we expect that this isn't just an automatic transformation. Right? Just like modernization theory is, uh, has a paucity of human agency in the sense that you don't just go to bed one day a dictator and wake up the next day a Democrat, it's also the case that you don't go to bed one day thinking that the best way to legitimate your regime is through authoritarian means and the next day to say we should concede. We expect there to be intra-party struggle. We expect there to be conflict. 
And this is where good qualitative work matters. You need to understand these struggles. You need to really get in the archives. You need to interview the right people. You need to marshal the evidence to document these struggles. And indeed, in these struggles, people may misread the situation. They mis may miscalculate. They may, may make misperceptions and so on. But what's most important to us in our analysis is the struggle. And indeed, the choices that are made after the struggle. We don't purport to be able to read people's minds. We don't really know what Zheng Jingguo was thinking, despite all the jokes that one might hear about him in Lida Hui. We don't really know what No Te Wu was thinking. We have since had the opportunity to interview some dictators in parts of Africa to get a sense of what they're thinking. We don't know what they were thinking, and we don't really care. What matters to us was documenting the struggle and then looking at the choices and decisions and the public decisions that were made after. And in the cases that we study, at least the positive cases, the decisions that were made after were what we call decisive reforms. These were serious reforms. You had, for instance, the institutionalization of free elections. You had the institutionalization, I will say, of fairer elections. I would never say fair elections. Uh, free and unfair elections, I think, is a fair uh, way to characterize Taiwan's legislative elections early on. We see the creation of electoral commissions. We see the releasing of political prisoners. We see not so much in Taiwan, but in other cases, media reform. In other words, we see decisive reforms by which the possibility of defeat to the ruling party becomes real, no matter how unlikely. And we're confident in saying that we see these reforms in Taiwan, South Korea, and even in, Indo in Indonesia. So this gives us evidence of that legitimation strategy. Now again, the best case, of course, is Taiwan. The KMT has, enjoys tremendous antecedent strengths. Of course, we know the developmental state legacy in Taiwan. We also know how much credit the KMT claims for it. We know the positive effects of land reform, no matter how violent they were. We know that the state played a role in the commanding heights of the economy, as our colleague T.J. Chang talks about. We know that the developmental state was grafted upon a Leninist party state regime in which civil society was co-opted and industry was organized through corporate means. And we know that the party and the state refused. In other words, the party had tremendous antecedent strength. We also know that the party had tremendous strength in terms of its limited elections. These were unfair and not free elections. But it gave the KMT a hell of a lot of experience. Anyone who studies electoral processes in Taiwan knows that the KMT was masterful and remains masterful at an electoral mobilization at the local level, masterful at black gold politics and mobilizing their voters at local level. Limited elections gave the KMT confidence, and it gave them tremendous victory confidence. We also know, however, that the KMT, beginning in around the 1980s, began to experience ominous signals. The Danwai opposition in, supplement, in, in legislative elections in 1980 Again, unfree and unfair, won 8% of the popular vote. In supplementary elections in 1983, the Dunhuai candidates, they were never a party, the Dunhuai candidates win 16% of the vote. In 1986, the Dunhuai candidates win 22% of the popular vote. By this time, the KMT's share of the popular vote had declined to 69%. Now, I'm not talking about seat share. Seat share in a, in a jerry-rigged situation doesn't make a difference. I'm interested here in popular vote. The Dalai movement was also a rise of an opposition. It was an opposition movement in which we see cross-cutting cleavages. And we see a Dalai movement that is built around the politics of identity, which in many ways cut to the legitimation formula of the KMT. It really cut to the core of the KMT in terms of the raison d'etre on being in Taiwan in the first place. And of course, also, the KMT experiences geopolitical pressure. This was the time in which, there was a time in which in Congress, Taiwan and the KMT was viewed as the guardian of free China. And this language had turned into those KMT thugs. Well, we begin to see this not only in the calls of Congress, but we also begin to see this in editorials in American newspapers. In other words, the KMT had antecedent strength, but it had passed its apex of power. And we do see, and there is evidence, of struggle within the KMT in one view is to potentially concede to thrive. So Dan and I write 
in our article. The KMT ultimately chose to concede democracy because the party was in a position not of desperation. Remember, this was still an extremely powerful party, and electoral results since then have borne this out. But a fairly strong confidence that democratic concession would ensure both the KMT's electoral victory and the maintenance of stability. The point I want to stress here is the KMT concedes democracy when it didn't have to. This was not a party on its last legs. This was not a party hanging by a thread. Jiang Jingguo was not hanging by a thread. He is not the analog to Mubarak. But this was still a very strong party. It could have hung on. And indeed, and only counterfactual history will ever tell us, it could have even rebounded. But it nonetheless at the time had confidence that if it did concede, it would minimally survive and maximally thrive. Again, here it was not just simply the cost of democratic reform, but the potential gains. The KMT had a lot of victory confidence. Let's not kid ourselves here. When the KMT concedes democracy, I use the term free and unfair election. The KMT institutionalized an electoral system, and our colleagues working on Taiwan uh, have written extensively about this. They institutionalized an electoral system in which there were freer rules, but were entirely not fair. The single non-transferable vote multi-member district system was a system that benefited the KMT. The KMT also dragged its feet on media reform. The KMT still, as of yet, is fully to disclose its assets. It's believed to be one of the richest political parties, if not the richest political party in the world, but we don't really know. But nonetheless, it had victory confidence in the sense that it could legitimately portray itself as the party of reform. It glommed on to, quite instrumentally, a democratic narrative. It reappropriated a long, deep history of a democratic narrative. It propped up a native Vidal who would then be able to talk about a Taiwanized Taiwan or Taiwanese people. It had victory confidence because it had a phenomenal economic record, or at least it claimed for itself an economic record. And this would appeal to middle class voters, as it did in Korea, and indeed as it's shown in electoral results since. And indeed, the KMT had cross cutting appeal. And not only had victory confidence, it also had stability confidence. Beginning in the 1970s, it began a strategy of localization and Taiwanization. It brought local Taiwanese into the party, into the state apparatus. It negotiated the terms of transitions with the DPP, and there's been some good evidence now about the kinds of meetings that were held prior to democratic con concession in which the KMT and, the, and what would become the leadership of the DPP actually begin their negotiations. I also argue that the KMT in many ways blunted, especially class cleavage. One of the legacies of Taiwan's post-war economic growth was that it was growth with relative equity. So unlike the class politics and the destructive class politics that you see, for instance, in Latin America and indeed in parts of Southeast Asia, you don't see in Taiwan. And I've made the argument in other pieces that this also allowed the state the strength uh, in order to redistribute upon uh, democratization. In other words, the key point here is that the KMT was fairly confident. In fact, I'd say very confident. And Daphne and I were talking about Jiang Jingwu never imagined losing. He was extremely confident that if the KMT were to concede democracy, Taiwan would remain stable and the KMT would win. And so far, the KMT has been right. The typical reading of Taiwan and for those of you involved in Taiwan studies will know this. The typical reading of Taiwan usually falls in one of two camps. One is that Taiwan is a phenomenal vindication of modernization theory. This is a great story of modernization. The other typical reading of Taiwan is that this is a vindication of Gettys. Parties want power, and the KMT had no choice but to concede democracy. Our argument, however, suggests an alternative pathway. Indeed, the KMT wants power. Jiang Jingguo had no intention of giving up power, but they had a choice. And they chose to concede not from a position of weakness, but from a position of strength. And this is what Dan and I referred to then as the paradox of conceding thrive. When a ruling party enjoys substantial incumbent capacity, in other words, strength, this not only increases its ability to sustain authoritarian but it can lessen its imperative to do so. I mean, if you think about that for a moment, right? A party with the capacity to continue ruling through authoritarian means may have every incentive to give up 
that authoritarian power. And we want to argue that that's what's happened in Taiwan. Taiwan is, I want to argue, an alternative pathway. As I've suggested to you, Taiwan is the best case scenario. In our paper, however, we show that there's an array of cases. Taiwan is the best case scenario. Korea is less good. Indonesia really almost hurtled through. It's even less good. Our argument, therefore, is that the closer you are to the apex of power, the more likely you are to thrive. Now, we have suggested, and indeed the title of the talk suggests, that Taiwan's pathway is an alternative. But when you actually look at the data, perhaps Taiwan's pathway is not so much an alternative. In 1986, there were 83 by one measure, and there, we don't publish this because there are some potential coding problems. Um, and we, we asked one of our graduate students to, to look into this. But anyway, you'll get the main point. In 86, there were, by our count, 83 authoritarian ruling parties. Since that time, 35 have remained authoritarian. 48 have democratized. Of those 48, 18 of them continued to be competitive major parties. 15 of them continued to be competitive minor parties. And only 15 of them had become obsolete or defunct. In other words, 33 of 48 parties conceded democracy and survived, minimally and maximally. In 18 of those uh, 48 cases, they have, in fact, thrived. In other words, then, Taiwan may not be so unique. What we try to explore in the book, then, are what we call candidate cases. Let's look at some other cases and look at the ruling parties and see if the logic that we're describing here holds there as well. And since then, we've done some field work in Burma. We've done some field work in Ethiopia as well. Of course, the biggest candidate case is China's Communist Party. Does the CCP have antecedent strengths? Absolutely. But where does the CCP fit on the, that curve? Is it at the apex of power? Is the party continuing to accumulate power so it's still on the upwards curve? If it is at the apex or it's continuing to accumulate power, then our theory would predict no democracy. We won't see any democracy anytime soon. If it's just past the apex of power, then we would expect a higher probability of a concede and thrive scenario. That we could imagine the Chinese Communist Party conceding and thriving. If the party has hurtled through the bittersweet zone, then we should expect the party to hang on to the bitter end and basically repress the hell out of society and hang on for as long as they can. Our sense is that the CCP is just past the apex of power. Like the case in Singapore, we want to make the argument that in many ways the timing is right. That if the CCP were to concede democracy today, there is no conceivable way it would lose. And if it were to concede political liberalization today, there's no, there's no conceivable way that the country would, despite the fears that the CCP might have, that the country would fall apart. In other words, at least in terms of the theory we're presenting, it seems to us that there should be a high likelihood of democratic transition in China. Now, let me finish by saying, I've presented this paper many times in China. I have, the, I have the, uh, uh, the privilege of doing a lot of research there. I go to China at least uh, two times a year, and I've given this paper across the country. And I've given this paper to students. I've given this paper to party cadres. I've given this paper to academics. I've given this paper, or we have given this paper, to a cross-section of Chinese society. Well, and we always ask. Where is the CCP on this curve? Right. Because everybody buys our logic. They see, well, that logic makes a lot of sense. Right. So we said, all right, well, in your mind, then, where is the CCP on that curve? Well, first of all, the first joke that gets out of the way is they say, well, all we, this is, their, this is a friend of mine at, at Fudan University in Shanghai, he says, all I know is that if the CCP were to concede democracy, it had better do it before uh, Taiwan comes as he puts it, comes back to China because the KMT would whip the CCP in any election. 
So that was his, that's the sort of joke. <laughs> the GAMT would win any election that it had to run in, and the CCP should work. But more seriously, the reactions to this question, where on the curve is the CCP, completely mixed. There are some who would argue that the best time uh, was in 1989. Some would argue that 1989 was just a blip. That in fact, and indeed empirically, it's true that China has continued to rise. The party is continuing to accumulate strength. Some argue that corruption is a threat to the party now, that this is a signal that it has passed its apex of power. Others argue quite intelligently that no, actually, the CCP in Beijing has done a very good job of localizing corruption, of basically saying, we, the party, are not corrupt, the local officials are corrupt. <laughs> Some will say there are tremendous economic bottlenecks on the horizon. Sustainable economic development, the pollution problem, inequality, job creation, the hard reforms of liberalizing the banking sector, local debt, and so on. That these bottlenecks are on the horizon and the CCP would do well to democratize sooner rather than later. Others say that the CCP has demonstrated an enormous capacity to adapt and to manage these economic bottlenecks. Others say that the party has no idea where it is on the curve. Others say that the party completely knows. When I talk to some officials about this, they will say, and they'll make very interesting comments, they'll say, Professor Wong, this logic makes a lot of sense, but I want to make a distinction for you between long-term party interests and short-term personal interests. For the long-term party, it absolutely makes sense to democratize now. But in the near term, could we just wait five years for my son to graduate from Harvard? I have some things I need to take care of. Let me finish by saying our theory is not intended to be predictive. At best, it predicts struggle. In the end, we want to make the point that democracy is not just simply a function of socioeconomic transformation, but rather it is a function of human choices. There are a whole host of reasons to expect that China will heed Taiwan's lessons, and there are an equal number of reasons to expect that the CCP will not. Thank you for your attention. Uh, how should we do this? Should we, should we sit down? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. These are still the are working. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure. But it, yeah, these are worth it. Right, thanks uh, for, for that, Joe. It makes my class tomorrow on comparative democratization a lot, a lot easier, I can just say. Just, just let's, um, what did Joe say? Yeah. Well, I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got about um, half an hour now for, um, uh, for, for Q&A. I think we should go straight into, um, into questions. Right, who would like to... Or, or, or discussion. I don't know that I have many answers. Yeah, well, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I, oh, uh, I do have one question. So um, the paper talks about how democracy can be a choice for China, but I wonder uh, if we should entertain the possibility that for a considerable period of time, democracy might not be the best choice for China. Um, I'm saying this because uh, the examples you gave are, uh, you know, Taiwan, Korea, these are uh, uh, relatively small countries, and China is big in many aspects, its history, its population, its minority groups, uh, with such a big difference in, uh, from Ch between China and these countries you listed. Would you say that democracy is truly the best thing for China to do, even if it is at the apex of power? Um, I mean, the short answer is not. It's not my. I'm not a citizen of China. It's it's uh, it's ultimately a decision for Chinese people to make. I've always believed that. It's it's. Um, I am very um, sensitive to and sympathetic um, to um, reactions when my friends in China say this is just an example, another example. They're kinder to me. They don't really say that to me. But you know, this is just another example of the West trying to impose a particular political system, and we hear it all the time. I guess my answer to you would be that um, at least the empirical evidence suggests that Indonesia is a pretty large place, um, uh, ethnically heterogeneous, uh, a lot poorer than Taiwan and Korea were, um, and 
and it's experienced a lot of hiccups along the way. Um, but it, uh, it made a certain set of choices in 1998 and 1999 um, that set it on a fundamentally different path. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate the complexity that comes with a country the size of China. Um, and, but I also have a tremendous amount of respect for the political leadership there to manage them. A kind of a follow-up question that, that, that crossed my mind to, to, to your question was, I, uh, rather than size being a, a, a major difference, maybe um, not having prior electoral experience. I mean, if we think about the South Korean um, um, and Taiwanese cases, we've got basically four decades of, of electoral experience. Do you think that would be a, a more important variable? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So when we, when we have frank conversations in China, and this is, this is with friends, um, never in the open. Um, and they will ask, well, what would you suggest? You Are you really, is what you're really saying that, you know, the CCP should just open this all up tomorrow? And, um, you know, no, one never wants to have the weight of, of these things on their head. So, um, I, as, an, as, a, as an academic, I equivocate my backpedal. Um, but I do, I say one thing that I think is very important. I said, you would do well by actually institutionalizing some form of electoral mechanism, if only so that you can get a better read on society, and so that you can get so that you can get a better read on society, so that when I ask the question, "Where on the curve are you?" I don't get you know a complete you know spiky distribution across um, four different answers, and um, so that your politicians can gain electoral experience. I, I really do believe that you would do well by that, and that shouldn't threaten the regime, but you would do well by putting into place some institutions that will actually allow for the party to make a little better sense of its society and also give its political class uh, a different kind of incentive structure. Clearly, if we were to be believed that what motivates local party officials right now in China are things like promotion, um, you would do well by maybe replacing those incentives with things like service delivery and electoral incentives. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, I have a question about, uh, so in these cases, about when, 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 when those states uh, begin to democratize, so the, the, the election starts from a national level or, or will starts from a local level if they have that not previous global election experience? Well, in all of these cases, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we've spent some time uh, now in, in, in all places, in Ethiopia, and EPRDF is a ruling party there. They, I'll tell you, I was telling David, um, the folks in Ethiopia and Botswana uh, in Zimbabwe, South Africa, they know Taiwan politics better than people in Taiwan do. They know the story very clearly. Um, and, you know, that's one of their big concerns, right, is, well, how do we actually manage this? What kind of elections are you talking about? And our point, um, in terms of our work, and again, this is academic work. We're not activists, right, and this is academic work. Our work suggests, look, you know, there's a panoply of institutional forms that you can take, but what does matter, though, is that the reforms have to be decisive. They have to clearly signal to the opposition that this isn't just dragging your feet. So when we're in Ethiopia and we're talking to the leadership of the EPRDF, they say, well, what do you mean by a decisive reform? We said, well, you know, freeing political prisoners is a decisive reform. Um, uh, removing seat bonuses for the military, as is the case in Burma, is a decisive reform. Uh, they shouldn't threaten the regime, if that's what their concern is. <coughs> Certainly not in the EPRDF. It would threaten the regime, the USDP in Burma, but not in, in Ethiopia. But these are decisive reforms. The problem is when you get an answer back that says, well, we don't have political prisoners in Ethiopia, <laughs> <laughs> then you know you're just spinning your wheels. But if you're asking a serious question, you would say, the reform, that's for you to decide. That's fit for your society and your complexity. But it has to be decisive. Okay, yeah, we've got Mo and then uh, Costas. Right, so one of the reasons for you choosing to put China now ahead of its power, what exact reasons were you thinking about it? Why? Right? Not to really elaborate. 
Um, why do we think it's past its apex of hell? Um, we take seriously the number of protests. We take seriously the efforts that the Chinese state now has to exert, and not just the efforts, but the money, in terms of the public security, public security, public peace bureau. Um, these were all on the rise. Uh, we take seriously the social economic bottlenecks on the horizon. Um, levels of inequality are rising. Job growth is slowing. Um, we take very seriously local debt which is something that the Chinese state had done a very good job of hiding for about a decade until the data started coming out saying this actually doesn't make sense. Uh, we take very seriously that um, the difference between the official Gini coefficient uh, and levels of income inequality based on household expenditures is vast. Um, so China has done a phenomenal job of lifting people out of poverty. It's done a phenomenal job of growing its economy. Um, but we see dark clouds on the horizon. But we see a party that, again, I'm, you know, as a political scientist, it's just inconceivable that the CCP would lose. Who it could be? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I would like to ask uh, the leaders. So do you think it's more likely for a unified leader to take a decision to democratize, or is it more for a speed to balance the world? Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, you know, we talk about it as intra-party struggle, um, and we're not nearly as precise as the generation before O'Donnell, Schmidt, or people like that who talk about hardliners, softliners. I mean, I think in many ways that's a post facto kind of assignation of who's a softliner, who's a hardliner. You know, I think Jiang Jingguo now is known as a softliner, but who would have thought that in 1983? Um, we just, ex we expect struggle. We expect that there will be, as there should be, any rational person who says, I don't want to let go because I've got, I've got too many interests pinned down in this particular uh, regime order. But we also expect there will be some who say, you know, in the long run, your interests will be better served if we were to make a political transformation. So we expect struggle. We don't assume that the party will just overnight transform its strategic thinking. Um, but we don't go beyond signing, you know, hardliners, softliners, uh, reformers, non-reformers. You know, I said, I don't want to tell you a story of great men. And it's true. I don't want to in any way suggest to you that KMT was nice, that Jiang Jingguo was a nice liberal Democrat. Just as in my earlier work, I don't want to suggest to you that KMT is a social democratic party. Just as they legislated the universalization of health to win votes, the same reason why uh, we seek political concessions. It's to secure the power. Great Denny's is right. Who wants to give up power? Okay, yeah, I've got a question at the back in the purple shirt. And then, and then Ed after that. Oh, yeah, and Mike. We've got at least three questions there. Um, yeah, with China in mind, why uh, China's had such a sort of tumultuous history since 1949? And I realize these things are a timeline. But what makes the problems that you said we see in the future now different to problems that they face uh, like when Chairman Mao died and the different the timeline between Mao and Deng Xiaoping, why why would it happen in the future is instead of then? Yeah, I mean some people there are some brave souls who will point to the nineteen seventy eight democracy wall movement, uh, basically the end of the Mao era as being a potential democratic opening. We use these historical moments as evidence that that Chinese people are actually capable of thinking about democracy, but we don't really think of them as choice um, apex moments. And one of the differences is because I think people's expectations in China are a lot higher today than they were in 1978. Um, and I mean, there's the classic argument that there's more information proliferating and so on. I buy all that as well, but I just think that people's expectations uh, are fundamentally different today than they were then. There was a belief, you spent time in the countryside, there was a belief, in, you know, a decade ago when you'd ask people, you know, you're in the countryside and even in like Zhejiang province or something like that, you'd say, look at Shanghai, like, don't you, don't you feel kind of ripped off? And they'd say, no, you know, this is good for China, this is good for the nation, it will trickle down. We're hearing that less and less. People's expectations are different now. Okay, yeah, uh, Ed. Oh, Ed and then um, Ryan and Mike. Maybe we should actually take a few questions. That, um, 
Okay. Yeah, should we do it? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, should I, should I come? Yeah, go on then, please. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously it's very difficult to argue with the, the logic of, um, of, of, of your hypotheses, but um, I was wondering, do you not feel that, in terms of thriving after conceding, that uh, Taiwan uh, and, and, and the Guomindang were in a very unique position with their electoral experience, which is certainly not the case in a lot of um, places that would be conceding. They don't have that electoral ground base, the experience of fighting elections. Yeah, right. Yeah, very interesting. I, I really like your theoretical um, approach. That is a sweet spot. I think it's got a lot to uh, a really good tool to understand how things are developing and how you know uh, how th from authoritarian to democratic um, shift. Now, my question is going to be about um, the sunflower movement, the umbrella movement, and how we could look at these two cases in order to get some um, to measure how China might be able to somehow react to in the way Hong Kong is currently um, challenging the Beijing. Um, so I would just do, if, if you could just give me some clarification on that. So um, how China, Commenting on the yeah, the sunflower movement, movement, which is the case, the yeah. students yeah, yeah. In, in Taiwan, <coughs> and um, how you look at, you know, how you observe that compared to the umbrella movement oh, in Hong Kong, Sorry. and also, I mean, our second question is, how do you think China is going to react to the protests? You know, really um, demanding for real democracy in um, in Hong Kong. Maybe you better take those, those two. Because that, that, that one yeah. seems it's a hard one. Challenging enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, these are all very uh, challenging questions. Um, one more historically rooted one that um, looks to the future. Um, is Taiwan a unique case? Absolutely. It's the best case. It is the case upon, I mean, this is a very, this is an inductively generated um, theory, if you will, in which Taiwan is the best case. And we have an array of cases, right? So we say Taiwan is the best case. We say Indonesia is the worst best case. Um, and, and, for the, and for the empirical reasons I just described, I mean, KMT continually wins legislative majorities, Golkar wins a plurality in, in 99. These are very different fates to the party, certainly Indonesia's democracy has suffered some battlements, whereas um, uh, the KMT doesn't seem to be, despite its own protestations about uh, its sufferings, it really hasn't suffered. So Taiwan, I think, is very unique. But having said that, we were just as surprised when we began to comb through the data and begin to see, actually, that Taiwan's experience, that is, a regime that concedes and minimally survives, or in this case, thrives, is actually a much bigger universe of cases than we expected. Right. And it really is, empirically, and, it, and, and we have to do a lot of work. And we're not going to do a Haggard and Coffin where we're going to look at every case in the world or anything like that. But suffice it to say, I think we have a good enough empirical starting point to say that what happened in Taiwan was a perfect storm for the KMT, but the logic that we're using, what we're inductively generating from the Taiwan case, actually goes a long way to explain a lot. And I, I've actually even made the argument, you know, um, I'm on sabbatical this year, I'm, I'm based at Nuffield College, at, in Oxford, and Bob Kaufman and Steph Haggard were there, and Bob is a specialist on Latin American politics, and I tried out the argument with him on Chile. And his first reaction was, this makes no sense at all what you're talking about. I said, no, 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 just, just think about it for a moment. When Pinochet launches the plebiscite in 1980, there was no way he thought he would lose. So I can't explain why he concedes in 1988, but well, we know why he concedes in 1988, because he basically negotiates his education and makes sure that he stack the judiciary, stack the Senate, and stack the military. But how do you explain his decision in 1980 to launch the plebiscite? He expected all the democratic gains that the KMT eventually saw, but he thought he would win. And frankly, in 1980, before the debt crisis, before all of the other things that racked Latin America, he had every reason to believe he would win. 
So the logic, uh, we're not trying to fit square pegs into round holes here, but the logic actually, I think, explains a lot more, even if it's not the beautiful case of time. With respect to the, um, the sunflower movement and the uh, umbrella movement, um, I mean, sun, there's, there are many ways. Let me begin by saying this. I mean, I think that, that Taiwan is a democracy, right? Um, is, it a flawed, is, it, is it a flawed democracy? Of course. Are there perfect democracies? Absolutely not. So, um, but it's a democracy. So I think fundamentally, uh, the way in which uh, people mobilize, the way in which people's expectations are shaped as a result of the mobilization, and maybe this is what led to even more disappointment in Taiwan than we see in Hong Kong, um, I think are fundamentally different in Taiwan than in the case of Hong Kong. Um, the question then is how will the PRC um, uh, react? Um, I, I can't tell the future. Um, I can assure you that the PRC has reacted to things quite differently than I would have ever predicted in the past. So um, I can't say with any certainty, in fact I would say with complete uncertainty, as to what the PRC, PRC will do to react. I can say, however, there's no indication that they're going to concede. Um, and we begin to see, you know, arguments about what well, time is on their side. Absolutely, time is on their side. And, um, you know, partly because of the domestic political discourse, which is legitimating the CCP by and large, partly because of, you know, um, editorialists <coughs> like that of Martin Jatz, who says that, you know, Hong Kong is just jealous of China's material gain, which makes no sense to me, uh, to, um, you know, to the argument that, look, authoritarianism is good for near-term economic development. I mean, these, and the authoritarian advantage uh, should endure. I mean, these are very powerful arguments and they're very difficult to uh, defeat. And so I don't see any reason why the CCP would concede anytime soon irrespective of what our theory would say is more or less likely. Yeah, uh, Mike. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I don't know quite how to formulate this, but uh, looking at the um, beautiful curve, parameter like curve, which uh, is obviously schematic, I know, but what are the variables driving that process, um, which you present really as a, um, a statistical or phenomenological thing. Uh, there must be mechanisms, kind of systems theory mechanisms behind that with feedback very on and there may be some sort of alternative analysis and so on. Um, also, uh, can you take more account of discontinuities in the historical thing? And it does mean that provisions <coughs> must be highly um, perturbational things going on, as we see in, in, the, in the various historical cases. So what has been said about the kind of variables that are driving that curve, to give it that, that rather smooth form? Right. Um, you're absolutely right. The curve is, is it's, it's a stylized curve, it's schematic. It's intended to be. Um, illustrated more than anything else, and it certainly isn't smooth, right? Um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm gathering, I mean, that's what you're, you're, you're pushing on, is that, you know, the curve itself is, is subject to, you know, tremendous fluctuation, and we agree with that 100%. I mean, it, it's, there's no reason to assume, and indeed, as I said, you know, there are some who will say the CCP has passed the curve, and there are some who will say, it's just, it's like a dip in 91. And beginning in 93 with structural reforms, it begins to rise again. Um, we have the benefit of history to know that that is by and large right, um, at least in terms of economic uh, development. Um, but what we're most interested, therefore, then, is not the fact of having passed the APEX, but rather the political struggle within the party and how they understand. And so in that respect, we have a very open-ended view of what constitutes antecedent strength and power. A lot of this is, again, inductively generated from the examples that we have, but there are a whole host, a whole host of different kinds 
of antecedent strengths. We could imagine, for instance, one, one of the things that um, uh, one could point out, for instance, in the case of Korea, is this is a relatively, homo no, it's not relatively, this is a completely homogeneous society. So there are different kinds of cleavages that can translate into different sources of strength. What matters to us most, and this is why, again, I would encourage, despite um, my having been trained in the U.S. and my colleagues in the American Political Science Association, good qualitative work about those particular moments of struggle will tell a lot in terms of what's actually going on inside the party and how they're proceeding. And whether it's empirically true or not, the past the effects actually don't matter to us. It's what the people inside are saying. Yes, what is the correlation between popularity and power? Yeah, we use popularity and we use the popular vote as an indicator of, um, of strength. Now, we're not actually, it's a very good question, we don't use electoral shocks as an indicator of absolute strength, but rather it's the change over time. That's why it's a precipitous decline over time that really matters, for instance, for the KMT. And what we want to argue is it really matters for the PAP in Singapore. That it's actually suffered a few, you know, it's, the PAP still wins handily but it's beginning to suffer, um, and so um, it's beginning to see decline over time. Uh, by the way, I mean, you, you mentioned that the response to your um, uh, theory and talks in China. What about in Singapore? Because in, in many ways, it seems, Singapore seems a fantastic case. Yeah. Um, in many ways, seem, uh, the PAP would probably do um, far better than the CCP yeah. if we could have <coughs> completely free elections. Yeah. Um, I think the, the reaction, um, I haven't given this paper in Singapore. If any of you have read my last book on biotech, uh, you know why the Singaporean government has not invited me back to Singapore. Uh, so I haven't given this paper in Singapore, but Dan has given this paper in Singapore. And his, you know, his reactions that he shared with me is that uh, most folks that really agree with the logic, they find the logic compelling. There is much less variation in terms of where the PAP sits on the curve. There's much more consensus that the PAP is extremely powerful, but that it's passing its apex. Um, but again, the fact of the matter is democracy doesn't just happen when you go to sleep. It has to be chosen. And most people are saying that, that, that it really is going to depend on the death of Lee Kuan Yew. Okay, yeah, we've got a couple of questions in the, in the middle there. Uh, as uh, with the CCP initiated uh, political reformation, uh, what do you expect the people will get after, uh, after the political reformation? And could CCP achieve those goals without a political reformation? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, if CCP initiated the uh, political reformation, what will it bring to the people, to the Chinese, what after, would to the people despite the CCP party? What would it, I'm sorry, what would it bring? Yeah, what would it bring? What people can get from the political information? Oh, I see, um, I see. And okay. if, if the CCP do not initiate the political information, could it achieve the same and dictate the people the same? Sure, yeah. That's why, you know, look, it's not my business what, uh, it's not my business to tell Chinese people what they want. Um, it's, uh, if the CCP can deliver what Chinese people want, uh, then absolutely. Um, so again, I, I don't want you to misinterpret this theory as infusing content into what people's preferences are. I'm not at all saying what people's preferences are. All I'm saying is that if the party begins to perceive that its own legitimacy, and frankly, there are lots in the party who believe this. There are lots in the party who believe the party's actually heard the right through. And there are people who kind of said, seriously? And they're like, totally serious. The party is gone, and it's hanging on. These are party people, right? So, you know, it's not me to put content into the preferences of what people want, or what citizens want. Um, all I'm saying is if, if the uh, CCP can deliver the goods with such confidence, and people want the political choice, then there's no conceivable way they could lose it. But if people don't want the choice, that's their choice. I mean, again, I'm, I'm just a Canadian. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, if I'm a decision maker in, in the CCP, and I'm being told that uh, Taiwan is the best case uh, to look at, 
the best case scenario. Um, and then I see that even within like 10 years of Taiwan uh, start, like starting elections, they'd, they'd lost presidential elections to the DPP already, and uh, Chen Shui Bian became president. Um, then won't I just think, oh well, even in the best case scenario, my part, the, part, the strongest party still lost. So if we assume that um, people want to hold on to power, then why, why would I even look at the best case, which lost power? I would surely just want to stay, stay here and kind of, well, even, I, even I, if I know it's a bit of a spot. Mm -hmm. uh, before Joe responds, I mean, uh, my immediate thought on that question is, uh, in, in, it seems to me, in many ways, the DPP coming to power actually strengthens the KMT. Uh, the KMT actually comes back much stronger after being out of power. Um, that would be, now, uh, but you want to come back? Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, many people in Taiwan don't really think that about President Ma anyway. I, I don't think... But he was elected, though. He was elected, but um, there's been, especially in the past couple of years, in quite a lot of problems. Sure. And, um, on, on an individual level, um, isn't it, um, why, I don't understand why, you, you're talking about the KMT on a party level, mm -hmm. so why would I as an individual uh, decision maker want to give up my own personal power? You mentioned about indivi at the individual level wanting your son to go too hard before you give up the power, it's the same kind of question. Yeah. Why would you at an individual level, why would you, not everyone cares about the KMG, mm -hmm. the CCP as a whole, they care more about themselves. It's a great question, and, and I, and, and I um, intimate uh, my concerns about that by bringing up in a half-joking way, although you picked up on exactly the flaw in the theory, is the difference of short-run preferences versus long-run preferences. Right? And that's one of the real problems is that if we are if we are in the end saying that democracy is a choice, that this is a function of human agency, then there are two sets of preferences that an individual decision maker who would be struggling within the party has to contend with his or her short-term preferences versus the long-term preferences. And that's something that we have to, uh, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna finesse that yet in the book, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an important point. But to the larger issue, I mean, it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a very, uh, it's a good point, but you know when we, uh, when you talk to a dictator, um, and you can say to them, as, uh, you know, as we have, and you say to them, look, do you believe that this authoritarian regime will last forever? Right. Um, if they're being truthful, they'll say no. Right. Forever is a long time. And then you say, okay, well, there are two fates that you as an uh, authoritarian party can um, entertain. You have two routes you can take. You can go the KMT route, or you can go the Mubarak route. Which would you prefer, right? Um, and if they believe in the first instance that nothing is forever, then it depends on how near term they think the threat is. But if you're rational, you choose the KMT route. So when we did some research in Ethiopia and we're interviewing, as it happens, everyone right up to the prime minister, the elephant in the room was, look around your neighborhood. Is that how you want to end up? Right? And they were keenly aware of it. That's what is motivating them to even engage with us. Was sort of this idea that there is this route out there that is unequivocally undesirable. So in that respect then, you know, these folks in Africa, they have a tremendous amount of respect for the KMT. They really think that, man, it, you know, if we could go that route, that's pretty good. I mean, you know, to Devin's point, when Mahindra was elected, the amount of power that he had in the executive and the legislature was much less constrained, I would say, than um, the waning days of CCK and certainly in the early days of the United so the KMT, yeah, it loses a couple of presidential elections. It always maintained control of the legislature, and it came back even more powerful. Now, Maijo is uh, not so popular, um, but I don't know. If I were a betting person, I wouldn't rule out the KMT from putting up a candidate for the next 
That's right, um, and you know the the cynical, um, the the anti-China scholar would say, you know, it's just a, that's a it's a fool's game that will eventually end. I'm not uh, a cynical anti-China scholar. I think that they're extremely adaptive and they're going to be able to um, continue to um, figure this out for a while. But what we're learning about, and frankly, what people are learning about in China now, are things that you know, frankly, ten years ago they just didn't know. And so, uh, for the corruption issue, for instance, I mean, this is this is a really, it's a really fascinating set of developments. How uh, Xi Jinping is now thinking about the corruption issue and the position of the central state. Um, it's an issue. It's always been an issue, right? I mean, if you look back to Mao era politics and you look at how fertilizer was distributed, it was it's just a different kind of rent. Um, but those kinds of corrupt practices existed back then. The fact of the matter is that the CCP Center has done a phenomenal job of localizing it. Right. Now, that's, that's a political tactic. That's a game. And um, there, will be, there will be some, I presume, who might end up saying, I don't believe that story. Um, yes, yeah, so further on the Challenging. You're absolutely right. You make a very good argument as to why the CCP should concede sooner rather than later. No, I don't. Know. <laughs> so I went to China. I went to Beijing in the summer, and actually, like you know, coming from a Western perspective, I thought maybe it was a bit more the Western violence thing. People want democracy, but then you go there, and it's right. seem quite content. Absolutely. So, um, as they should be. I mean, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal story. It's a phenomenal developmental trajectory, and. You want to have it keep going. Absolutely, you want to have it keep going. I guess for me, I just don't know how democracy would stop it. Okay, I think on that point then, um, we should uh, give Joe a big... Um, uh,